Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shovik Pine. I'm from India and I'm uh, one of the Young Professionals Network Officers uh, associated with the International Association for Adolescent Health. I also work uh, in a youth-led organization named the YP Foundation based in uh, New Delhi in India. And on behalf of uh, the International Association for Adolescent Health, Young Professionals Network, I want to extend a warm welcome to all the attendees. Uh, we really appreciate that you all took time out for attending this webinar, and I sincerely hope that uh, it would be an interesting one for all of you. Uh, so before we begin, uh, I would just like to give a small introduction to the International Association for Adolescent Health, uh, Young Professionals Network also. So uh, it is a multidisciplinary non-government organization which aims to improve the health, development, and well-being of 10 to 24-year-old adolescents and young adults uh, in every region of the world. The Young Professionals Network, or we would refer to them as a YPN, aims to provide diverse opportunities for young early career professionals around the world to further develop their knowledge, skills, and experience in adolescent health. Uh, the YPN aspires to promote collaboration and build relationships uh, between early career professionals and expert leaders uh, in the field of global adolescent health. And uh, as you all know, like uh, today's uh, webinar is uh, titled The Global Impact of COVID-19 on the Adolescent Health and Education. So, I mean, uh, since the world has been plagued by COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a massive, massive uh, effect on most of our lives in different ways. Uh, while the elderly population is definitely more vulnerable to the direct effects of the disease per se, but today's uh, our topic of discussion would focus on like, exploring the myriad of both direct as well as indirect effects uh, the pandemic is having, like, had and still continues to have on the adolescent population, especially focusing on their health and education aspects. Uh, to give us a comprehensive picture around this, uh, we are very thrilled to have a wonderful seven speakers who represent different parts of the world and would be sharing their unique perspectives from their own vantage point about how they have perceived uh, things have been going around in adolescent health, what has been the intervention, what has been the best practices, what has been the challenges. So you are uh, really looking forward to all of their perspectives and uh, I would just make some few logistical announcements uh, before we just uh, begin our uh, uh, conversation. So I would request that uh, all the attendees to kindly please uh, keep your mics muted. And as you can see on your screen, there is a chat box. Uh, please use that chat box to send in your questions, queries. If you have any comments, like please feel free to use the uh, chat box. And uh, which the question and answers also would be moderated uh, by our team around. So the questions you have which for a very specific panelist, you can also refer to that so that we can direct the question to the panelist. So yeah, and uh, we're also just going to just uh, quickly share like how the flow is going to be. So we were having these seven speakers across two panels. The first panel would actually feature three of our uh, speakers. Then we would have a set of question answer round for 10 minutes and then we would move to the second panel having uh, four other speakers and at the end of which there will be also question answers so yeah keep your questions coming keep your thoughts coming and like uh with a without much further ado i would like want to kick start the first panel so the first panel would include uh dr nicola gray uh dr Zoeli rizvi and uh dr veni moti so, uh, so first, I want to invite uh, Dr. Nicola Gray for like starting off the first panel. Uh, just uh, Dr. Nicola Gray is the current uh, IH Regional Vice President for the European Region. She is also an affiliated researcher to the UNESCO Chair of for Global Health and Education, and she is also an independent uh, pharmacist researcher uh, in Manchester, UK. Her research and policy interest would include uh, people's health, prevention, and management of NCDs, medicines, uh, information, and uh, health literacy. So, uh, so Dr. Kula, like to start off our conversations, I know like you had also focused a lot around how reopening of schools and adolescent education has been impacted because of the pandemic. So, I'd request you if you could uh, share with us 
what have been your perspectives? What are your thoughts? Like how you are seeing the pandemic affecting more of the world's adolescents, like education and maybe even the impacts on health. So over to you, uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be able to join you today and talk about a really important collaboration between IAAH and the UNESCO Chair in Global Health and Education. Um, the title holder is Professor Didier Jordan, who's based in France, and I am the IAAH partner for the chair. Next slide, please. Thank you. So IAAH formed this partnership before the pandemic in 2019, and you can see the, the nerve centre of the chair's team on the photo on the slide. And you may be familiar with the concept of the WHO Collaborating Centre. For UNESCO, the Education uh, United Nations Agency, it's called a UNESCO Chair. So it has a unique remit for both agencies. And our work has been focusing on building a community to support intersectoral work in schools and in communities for the benefit of children and young people. So that includes professionals from healthcare, health promotion, prevention, public health, education, of course, social care. It's a really diverse community. And of course, you would all be uh, invited to join. Next slide, please. So our work had already begun and then the pandemic hit. So it really threw this mission of intersectoral working in schools into very sharp focus. If um, I give you the context to a survey that we conducted with professionals in May, June, you will remember that by the beginning of May, many schools in most countries had closed in haste as part of national lockdown measures. COVID had spread through Asia in its first wave. It was particularly rife in Europe, but was only just penetrating Africa and the Americas at that time. And the value of the survey that the chair conducted was to collect perspectives from professionals in the field. So this was first-hand accounts of whether and how schools were reopening in different countries and what they thought would be the successes and challenges of making this happen. Next slide, please. So how were health and education professionals coping with the situation and what can we learn from this about the impacts on families, children and youth? Well, very much like the general population, there was a fear of infection. We have a correspondent from Jordan here saying we should be very cautious before reopening. Safety of students is most important. In my own country, the prevailing language was about a war, a battle against the virus. And I think that in that, and hoping that the battle would be won quickly, that it was difficult to have a conversation about the benefits and risks of reopening schools at that point. And we can also see that mental health problems were widely reported. And here a comment from France, you know, to recognise teaching staff at their fair value because they're exhausted and sometimes discouraged. Of course, they were trying to move everything from the classroom into remote learning. Next slide, please. And also, we were talking even then about the widening inequalities and the fears of what would happen to young people if schools stayed closed for a long time. So a correspondent from Latin America and the Caribbean was very worried about the economic impact of the pandemic on households and thinking that many adolescents may not go back to school and because they would be forced into a very fragile job market in order to support their households. In Greece, saying about the, the lack of investment in education and how the pandemic was laying bare, the lack of infrastructure in schools to cope with the crisis, and also an important point about children with special educational needs or educational disabilities of any kind and how the gap had already widened for them and the pandemic would make that worse. And then a correspondent from India reflecting on the issue of remote learning, saying that only 50% of urban households had the internet and only a quarter had a computer at home. And the fragile nature of platforms like WhatsApp that were being used to deliver education to children and young people. So they saw limitations there. Next slide, please. Then we tried to reflect on what the successes would be for school reopening and what they saw as the challenges. 
and the success was really based on cooperation again that intersectoral working between school teams local authorities and families that they would need consistent and timely information about school reopening at that point there were many different points of view circulating and they would need resources and equipment to actually make it work and as many of the procedures that were being proposed were health system led um, there needed to be an awareness of the education system itself and of the constraints in school in putting these into practice so you can see from france the success depended on political commitment creative spirit of teachers and principals preparation anticipation partnership exchange of practice really important and then the challenges would be a correspondent from the usa about disinfection procedures school meal programs keeping them going managing mental health issues finding personal protective equipment lots of challenges seen next slide please we published several articles over the summer about the reopening of schools with the UNESCO chair and I thought that this audience might be particularly interested in one we've just published about the return to school for young people with chronic illness. It struck us that this is already a population where there are inequalities in education. They don't tend to have as high aspirations with education as young people who do not have long term conditions and we saw a lot of language about this vulnerable group. And we felt that trying to put them into one box and call them all vulnerable was not helpful. So we proposed a framework identifying three groups, those at serious risk of contracting infection. And we hope that they might benefit from the remote learning developments and rapid telemedicine developments um, that we saw over the time of the pandemic. That those with well controlled symptoms of asthma or diabetes that we need to get them back into schools we start from a position where it's best for children and youth to be in school and so if they can go back go back but monitor carefully the benefit will outweigh the risk those with poorly controlled symptoms however this is where intersectoral working really is important that we need teamwork with families to devise their return plan and very effective communication between medical teams and schools. Next slide, please. And then we've been thinking more widely about the roles of health professionals in schools. And I give you a preview of a paper that we've written um, with our president, Susan Sawyer and others, just to think about the activities of health professionals in schools going forward. So we wrote it before the pandemic, but it's just as uh, important now, we think. So rather than the traditional idea perhaps of giving um, curriculum sessions in schools or providing health services, we think we can broaden this out to contribute to the recognition of the school's contribution to health improvement and reducing health inequalities, that health professionals can be real advocates and you know, really think about the legitimacy of schools getting involved in this and really fight for schools in their local communities. But during consultations in any health setting that might include in the doctor's office in the pharmacy question children and families what did you learn about this at school you know show that you value what they've learned in school and also find out a bit about what schools are providing um, in those terms of health education that we need to reframe health interventions in school to capacity building among school staff to making coherence for them in their teaching activities and in the healthy school environment about what is it they can do for ch young children and young people's health. And that includes building motivation and agency of teachers by being partners from the health field and supporting them in formal or informal training. And also this year we see that so the support for local health professionals in ongoing COVID measures could be really important. It struck us as really interesting that our correspondents in the survey, and that was 200 people from 42 countries, only a couple of French respondents talked about school nurses. And, you know, there was very little mention of local health professionals. So we think going forward, this is, a, you know, where we can all play a part. So we could advise on community transmission, offer mental health support, or planning and monitoring for young people with chronic illness. So we hope that everybody will be thinking about those about the pandemic response. Next slide, please. And so I leave you with two questions. You can see here at the top, these are the SDGs, the so Sustainable Development Goals, and we're showing number three for good health and well-being, and number four, education, very much combined together. 
And so we hope that you might answer a couple of questions for us. The first one being, what factors would enable more intersectoral working among professionals across these different areas? Keywords, please, would be great. We're going to try and create a word cloud. And the second one being about rating in your local area, the links between health and education professionals to support schools and the communication to health professionals about the reopening of schools. Um, we're doing this on the WOO clap platform. There's a code at the top YBHLBY, or you can put in the full URL and there is a QR code as well. Thanks so much for your time and I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nicola, for sharing your insightful presentation and your perspectives, like how adolescent education has been impacted and also like, like interconnectedness with health. I mean, thank you so much. And now we uh, look forward to actually uh, our next uh, panelist. And uh, before we just uh, move on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Zoya Lirisli, who is the Deputy Commissioner on Adolescent Health from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India. Uh, she had requested uh, two small videos uh, which speaks about the impact and also COVID and adolescent health related things. I'm just adding them into the chat for everyone. They can uh, see them at any point or whenever they uh, please. So uh, uh, Dr. Zoya is currently, as I just uh, mentioned, is working as a deputy commissioner in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. She's heading uh, the major programs which is focusing on adolescent health, uh, visualizing the Rashtriya Kishwa Swastha Karikram, or which translates into the National Adolescent Health Program in the country, which deals with more of promotive and preventive health care for adolescents in facilities, schools, and communities. Uh, she also looks into the Rashtriya Pal Swastha Karikram, which is more of the child health related uh, programming in the country, focusing on children between 0 to 18 years. Uh, in schools as well as in community centers across the country. Along with these, she also looks into the newly launched uh, school health program of the country and it works in uh, strengthening the partnership between healthcare providers and teachers. So this is just a brief uh, background about uh, Dr. Soya. And uh, Dr. Soya, like, uh, as a health ministry official who, who who is overviewing all of these different programs, which is focusing on adolescent health in the country. Uh, would request like if you could share with us like what has been your perspectives on how the adolescent health related services have been impacted due to this pandemic situation and I guess continues to uh, get impacted. Like what has been more of their consequences and as a ministry official, like what kind of interventions the uh, government of India has already put in and also continuing to do. So if you could share your perspectives around that, it will be really great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sovik. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me as a speaker. I have a slight difficult task because I will start with giving a short background about the Adolescent Health Program in India. We have many components, a few I will name. One of them is, is called the Adolescent Friendly Health Clinics, where we place trained medical officers and counselors to counsel the adolescents which are visiting them with any health issues. Besides this, we have a scheme which says menstrual hygiene in which you provide subsidized sanitary napkins to the adolescent girls. Then there's a scheme which, uh, which is called weekly iron folic supplementation program in which we give IFA tablets to the adolescent boys and girls. So another scheme we have is called the peer educator program, which I think is one of the very important schemes because that looks at involving the adolescents in schools and out of schools training them on various health issues so that they go back to their own groups and carry out small sessions, informing their group and thereby the community of all the health issues and how they can improve their behaviors. So if we look at all these programs, these were running quite well. We were covering about 50 million girls with sanitary napkins. We had covered about, uh, I think, 34% of our adolescent population with IFA tablets. We had about seven, 70 million children, boys and girls who visited our clinics. And we had about 350,000 peer educators in place who were being trained. And we had trained almost 200,000. So this was going on till we got COVID. So when COVID came, everything was just shut down because all the health resources then went towards COVID care, whether it was district level, whether it was block level, whether it was state level. So all our program, I would say, was actually more so because adolescents are perceived as the healthy population. So the government put most of its importance in saving lives for COVID. 
that being said we i think we came back we bounced back within a month and we issued guidelines for specially availability of sanitary napkins and availability of ifa for the adolescent girls so the distribution which was initially taking place through schools and through community centers then started by taking place through community outreach officers so when we had these speed level um, workers who are called ashas i mean you may have heard they are the three sets of field level health workers they are they come from health ministry as well as women and child department so these combined together they started doing outreach activity but this was this started maybe about a couple of months after the lockdown and this outreach aimed at reaching every young girl every young boy in the community by providing them with sanitary napkins providing them with iron folic supplementation and also contraception delivery for for at home for these adolescents so this was one step which the government took by increasing home visits by our field level health workers uh, i think all health precautions were taken by these health workers they were given pe kits initially and they were tested routinely for covid so this was one thing which the government came around and did for adolescents second thing which we which we did was open up this adolescent friendly clinics in which our trained people were there but then they ended up doing a lot of counseling because uh, as i think nikola also mentioned is that mental health was one thing which came out as a huge issue with the adolescents because with the schools being shut down i think small factories being closed jobs being stopped i mean this led to a huge break in routine for the adolescent for the young boys and girls so it it ended up having boredom frustration this lack of innovation so and this led to a lot of mental health issues as well as there was issues of violence at home so all these issues kind of started growing a lot and i think taking this into cognizance what governments uh, what we did i would say is that we tried doing mental health awareness campaigns we used our state officials we used our district officials and we gave them some capacities to actually look at the red flag signs what are the main issues if you're dealing with an adolescent who comes to your clinic or who's actually on a telephone helpline what are the questions you will ask and when will you refer the child or the growing uh, boy or girl to a mental health institution to a specialist to a uh, emergency care so these were something which we built on gradually we built the capacities of our state officials our district officials this is an ongoing process initially we used institute which is called tata institute of social sciences now who is also partnering with us so this capacities of our counselors is being built very rapidly because we i think put mental health right up there which is very important for our youth besides this we also used our peer educators who were sitting at home now we have started to bring them out in groups maintaining the physical distance but now i think and and the wonderful thing is more and more girls are coming out now these girls are going within the community they are distributing uh, facial masks they are distributing sanitary napkins they are showing hand washing procedures they are discussing within small groups so this is something which is a good thing a few states uh, in our country are doing very well in this but some states are picking up so it's like every state is innovating on its own also how to improve this awareness how to improve uh, access to health services and third thing i would like to say i think tele counseling is something which we are really strengthening we have uh, i think put in more counselors in place especially because there's a huge fear for covid all of you are quite aware the the fear is is like covid in self covid in parents covid in your near near and dear ones especially people who have lost somebody or who have seen the disability caused by covid so this sheer mental agony is there this feeling of isolation is there so we are stressing a lot on mental health stressing a lot in access to srh commodities which were normally routinely given in health institutions so now are being delivered by our health our healthcare workers in the field so gradually i think we are reaching there and we creating a lot of awareness like uh, this video which shovik has put in the chat box these kind of videos are a, a very strong part of our own interaction with the education department and for the strengthening we have uh, which shovik also mentioned was the school health program new program which was supposed to i think uh, grow hugely this year but with covid we had to you know take a step back and replan how to do the training and i think we did very well with this close coordination with education we have trained all our master trainers for states the the master trainer for each state has been trained again in an in an online manner so the whole method of training had to be changed so it was a challenge for us i think the the ministry of health as well as ministry of education so we i think we spent hours together to finalize how to make it easy for the trainers to be trained and then to even tell them what to do ahead because schools are not opening right now so how do they get access to teachers what do they do so this continuous hand holding 
continuous coordination is working and i would say i think india is doing a lot and uh, we hope to see a, a, a healthy adolescent back in the schools back in the colleges back at work very soon that's all for my side shobhik um thanks so much uh, dr soya for sharing like what has been the intervention what the challenges like the government themselves face and how they are able to like uh, cope with all of those intervention uh, in place uh, so yeah i uh, really uh, thank you so much for all of this uh, insightful uh, speech uh, so now we move on to our uh, next panelist and the last panelist for this uh, segment uh, dr veni muniati from uh, indonesia so uh, dr veni uh, muniati has worked for the ministry of health of indonesia since uh, 2008 in the directorate of child health and directorate of family health most of her working area is like school age child and adolescent health she has graduated from the medical faculty uh, of university in bandung in indonesia and has a masters of public health from the university of melbourne in australia she is responsible for preparing materials of school age child and adolescent health related guidance and regulation as well as conducting technical assistance and health program monitoring and uh, evaluation so uh, dr veni uh, being a ministry official uh, my question to you would be also kind of similar what i had asked for uh, dr zoya that we could also highlight like what has been the situation in indonesia like what are the major challenges uh, in terms of delivering of adolescent health related services in indonesia and how its consequences affected the adolescents in the country and what has been the ministry's intervention or uh, to kind of address these uh, challenges so uh, dr veni if you could kind of share around your perspectives on this uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction dr safik um i would like to uh, for me this is a great pleasure to talk to you today uh, i would like to share about um, adolescent and the pandemic effects in indonesia so i think um it is similar to other places around the world uh, the pandemic of covid-19 uh, has impacted uh, adolescents in my country uh, both directly and indirectly um, because uh, we noticed that uh, the covid-19 figures in our country uh, keep uh, increasing uh, including for adolescents and uh, it is recorded uh, adolescents like uh, 8% of the total uh, confirmed uh, cases and um, this is uh, becomes our uh, concern uh, although um, i think adolescent and school age children may appear to be the less at risk for a severe covid-19 uh, uh, as the uh, giving you uh, some background in our uh, Uh, policy for adolescent health programs uh, almost the same like india uh, we have uh, adolescent friendly health services uh, in every sub district and they also have like um, in the village level they have also like uh, other centers to support these uh, primary health centers uh, for adolescent health service centers um, we encourage uh, the health workers to provide um adolescent friendly service like they uh, beside the clinical uh, service they provide uh, counseling uh, they provide uh, uh, psychosocial uh, assessment for adolescent uh, contact uh, with uh, the health workers and also because uh, we uh, realize that a very uh, minimal amount of adolescents coming to health facilities so we expand our uh, service we provide outreach service for adolescent who uh, don't come to health facility uh, that becomes our main challenge like uh, in this pandemic situation because um, we encourage adolescents to not come to health facilities and then yeah with the uh, school closures and uh, so many activities are restricted so um, uh, contact adolescent to health workers even becomes uh, a, a minim a minimize uh, probably um uh I would like to share about um, the challenge that um, 
because of the school closure, uh, I think um, similar to what uh, Dr. Zoya said, uh, mental uh, issues uh, become uh, even greater in adolescents um, because they have to uh, stay at home. Uh, it is uh, challenging for them with the nature. They always uh, go uh, out of uh, the house uh, while now. Uh, they have to stay at home and then uh, not getting to see uh, friends or peers uh, and as well as they cannot uh, uh, join the uh, important e events uh, like uh, graduation or proms. Um, in fact, we know that uh, adolescence is the stage in life where they are really interested in social uh, connection and they uh, gradually enjoy to be separating from uh, their parents. So uh, social distancing uh, require, uh, requirement uh, may cause uh, different emotional impacts for adolescents. And then um, uh, in Indonesia, we also notice that uh, for uh, particularly in uh, lower income communities, the level uh, of stress and trauma even higher uh, because the impact are more severe, uh, the issue of uh, food insecurity, housing instability, and then uh, loss of family income uh, are identified in uh, so many households. Uh, adolescent in uh, low income community also have uh, major barriers to receiving uh, support uh, of their peers uh, compared to the higher income community because uh, they limitation access to the internet and then um, even for uh, the household with access to internet that uh, there may not be enough devices in the house for each kid so um, uh, we, we we had so many reports that uh, older children uh, may also have to take care of their siblings. So they may uh, have less time and opportunity to do their work with uh, schoolwork, and they have less concentration on uh, keeping up with schoolwork. So um, moreover, uh, like Dr. Zoya mentioned, abuse and uh, domestic violence also uh, increase uh, during this pandemic situation. So those adolescents who live in uh, a household uh, where there is abuse or interpersonal violence even are uh, at higher risk uh, because of uh, the staying at home policy. Um, in normal situation, Indonesia uh, already has disparity uh, regarding health and education. So this pandemic is like uh, exacerbate this uh, disparity. Um, responding to COVID, uh, the Minister of Health, um, I think um, we have reallocated our budget, uh, budget um, uh, and then we um, uh, provide task for uh, specific for the COVID-19 um, for adolescent health programs in uh, the field. We uh, at central level we revise our. A guideline. We uh, support the health worker in the field uh, how they can uh, ensuring uh, how they can ensure the program. I mean, uh, adolescent can access to essential uh, information and health services while the uh, prevention and the containment of COVID uh, can still be uh, implemented. And then um, uh, we also. Um, I mean, we also develop uh, the support for the parents to uh, accompany their children uh, studying at home uh, by um, like the Ministry of Education. We are in collaboration uh, across sectoral. So uh, the Ministry uh, of uh, Education and the Ministry of Health and to other minister, we uh, made, uh, uh, we provide uh, regulation to support uh, adolescent and uh, children. So while they stay at home, they have uh, support like internet from the government to uh, support their uh, study. And then our program now uh, is aimed to uh, improving the resilience of adolescent coping with uh, COVID situation. Because we know that um, 
uh, the adolescent needs to stay positive uh, during COVID situation. Uh, we noticed that uh, there is um, emotional and physical change uh, um, during adolescence. So while they have to cope with COVID, uh, they also have to uh, deal with themselves. Uh, so uh, we would like to, uh, our policy uh, is uh, aimed to uh, mostly to uh, deal or improving the resiliency among adolescents. Um, so uh, we see the pandemic is uh, challenging on one side, but on the other side, I think this is our opportunity to uh, for uh, the Ministry of Health reach uh, more health worker in the grassroots. Um, uh, since uh, basically we have limited uh, source, uh, for example, when we improve the capacity of uh, the health worker, uh, so they can uh, provide the standardized uh, service for adolescents. We um, usually we uh, it is limited to uh, only few uh, uh, worker uh, from a province or uh, districts. But now because we push everything, uh, I mean like education session, health education session to adolescents uh, online with online base. So we can involve, uh, we can invite, we can involve uh, more uh, worker, more health worker, so they can uh, expose to our policy faster than uh, before. So uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the positive uh, side of this pandemic uh, for us in the central level. Uh, we can uh, approach, all, we can reach uh, the health worker in the grassroots uh, even more. Um, and uh, regarding the school opening, um, in some uh, regions, um, a school uh, have uh, been uh, open with the implementation of uh, prevention and containment uh, steps. But um, uh, I think uh, we are still uh, on uh, progress, like to uh, uh, still to uh, maintain or we still uh, see, wait and see what uh, will happen. I mean, uh, because uh, the pandemic situation is so dynamic, one uh, green zone of uh, a region can uh, be uh, orange uh, in one day or uh, vice versa, the orange or um, sometimes we uh, we cannot, we, we didn't find any uh, confirmed case in that area. So, uh, Dr. Benning, if you could uh, kindly uh, wrap up your uh, speech so, so that we can okay. move on. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Thank you. So basically uh, what uh, we have done is aiming to support adolescents uh, during this uh, pandemic to uh, reach their full potential and also to support them uh, undergo this uh, transition uh, to be a healthy uh, adult. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, so I'll just uh, go on to the, the first uh, question while I request the audience to please uh, share in their thoughts in the book lab. Uh, link which has been shared. Uh, the question has been directed to uh, uh, Dr. Nicola uh, that uh, what are the effective methods for providing adequate distance learning options for adolescents and youth in uh, low middle and income countries, especially during lockdown? Uh, for example, in my country, uh, we have poor internet connections with unaffordable costs. So yeah, if you could uh, kindly share your thoughts on that. One of the, um, the responses that we had in the survey about communication, um, and it was communication between schools and families, schools and teachers, or indeed the national and regional structures and teachers, and brought out that some countries were using a variety of methods. And um, some of the ones that I think we take for granted, but perhaps can come into their own here, are like radio and television. Um, and there were some countries where they were putting teaching materials out through those channels. Um, and I think that it's important to try and, you know, think broadly so that the information about the pandemic that was going through to the general population was coming out through posters. It was coming out through debates. 
I know that doesn't lend itself particularly to the learning environment, but I think that there are ways of using print means and using, and, and I've always felt that radio was like one of the unsung heroes of health promotion um, and, you know, and, you know, a low cost alternative to making sure. And I think you're right to bring out that we cannot assume that everything online will be accessible to all children and youth. So it really is time to think creatively. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for your response. I hope uh, the person who asked the question got some ideas, like everybody's uh, struggling and this, uh, definitely uh, a few other options we have. Uh, so uh, the next question is actually based, uh, which can be answered by both Dr. Zoya and Dr. Veni. Like, please feel free to come in. The question is like, uh, we might expect that in terms of family poverty, that greater rates of child marriage might be seen following the lockdown and loss of employment. Uh, is this already being seen in India and Indonesia or not yet? Like, what is the situation if you could uh, kindly share? Okay, uh, I think I, I will answer it um, because I'm kind of ready with that. Is because, yes, we are seeing it in India because what has happened is during COVID, there were a lot of job losses. So the fathers who were earning out in some other cities have come back home. So after come back home due to shortage of money, so first thing they're seeing is they pulled children out of school. So maybe if they have a son and a daughter, so daughter is being married off and they're saving the money for the son. You know, the son will actually go to school. He will get some kind of education because he's the one who will look after them in the old age. So this whole concept of the son being the person who will look after them in the old age and the girl who needs to be just married off because she's an extra person who's eating, that has taken place in a lot, uh, lot of our backward states and a lot of our uh, districts which are anyway poor. So it's making things worse and these girls, are, we are hoping that a lot of our civil society organizations are working in this and we are getting information that it is an uphill task for them. And that's why we are involving more and more of our peer educators. And some states in the Northeast states, as well as in the Western states, there are peer educators who have come out and they have said they have stopped a couple of these marriages, which is a good thing. So this awareness is gradually going into the community that this is not the right thing to do. And girls are standing up and saying, I don't want to get married now. And she's informing her own group of peers and they are coming back and trying to convince the parents. But frankly speaking, it is very difficult. But yes, there are little, I think, hopes uh, of light here and there in India. Yes. Over to you, Savik. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Soya, for your response uh, for telling the situation in India. Dr. Veni, if you want to like uh, speak briefly about what's the situation in Indonesia on this. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Savik. Uh, there has uh, there have been uh, some survey uh, conducted uh, during pandemic uh, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic and yeah uh, some survey uh, noticed that there are the, the increase in the uh, child marriage uh, during this pandemic yeah because mostly because of the lost family income or because of, of the job uh, and so the uh, the girls uh, cannot uh, finish uh, their uh, studies so yeah uh, mostly in remote area, uh, parents uh, choose or even adolescents uh, themselves uh, choose to uh, yeah, uh, undergo a child marriage. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benny, for uh, sharing that perspective. I know like uh, there are a few questions which are uh, coming in the chat, but just in the interest of time, uh, I guess, um, we won't be answering them right away. We would also request, uh, maybe we'd just request uh, this question to be put on chat and we would pass it on to the respective panelists also and they might just be uh, able to respond to you just via chat even and so that we can uh, start our second panel on time. So really uh, sorry for that and appreciate uh, all the support and all the responses uh, you all are putting in. Like please keep them coming. So now we would be moving to the second panel uh, today. We have in the second panel, we have four exciting uh, speakers uh, here. We have uh, Shukti, who is an adolescent from India. We have Shirley, who is a medical student from Indonesia. We have Diana from Kenya, who works with uh, young people. She herself is a young person working with adolescent girls in Kenya. And we have uh, Dr. Sophie, who is an adolescent uh, health physician in the USA. So uh, without not uh, taking more time, uh, I would request uh, Shukti uh, to kindly 
share your perspectives like uh, i would just give a little background about uh, shukti uh, she is a 17 year old student at vidyashram high school in mysore karnataka she is affiliated with a nationwide autonomous youth group which focuses on adolescent health advocacy uh, the name of the group is called pwg steps or a policy working group stepping towards enhancing policy structures uh, through this group uh, she engages with initiatives to inform india's national adolescent health program and other relevant uh, programs and policies for young people especially in the area of uh, adolescent health so uh, shukti since uh, you are a school student yourself uh, it would be great to hear from you about how you have seen the pandemic has affected your academic routine for yourself or maybe also your peers and friends and how adolescents are able to kind of cope up with this academics moving completely to a virtual uh, platform you could uh, share you know the challenges uh, which are happening in this uh, space and also uh we know that you are a very passionate uh, advocate on adolescent mental health issues so if you could also share with us like what are the various mental health challenges adolescents like you are facing in this uh, pandemic situation and since we have a uh, panelists and uh, speakers who are doctors adolescent health practitioners government officials if you have any solutions any recommendations to suggest for them so it'd be great to hear your perspective over to you shakti so thank you for the introduction shovik um so due to the pandemic we are unable to go to schools or colleges to study and are attending classes online through virtual platforms so as students it has been a very difficult time for us to adjust to this new form of learning as we are so used to interacting with our peers and teachers and engaging in active learning due to digital platforms we are unable to interact effectively or comprehend our lessons well in my school we attend classes through zoom and youtube and while it is effective in many ways it isn't the same as studying in school it has made most of us lazy to attend class and the seriousness we once had for our academics is no longer there most adolescents are unable to access online classes as they may not have good network in their region or the cost for high speed internet is more or they are unable to afford gadgets it is a huge challenge for us to interact with our teachers and ask them doubts as we used to in our school and our quality of education has been impacted tremendously as the syllabus is comparatively cut down and the exams have been postponed as well most of us are spending more time on social media and are unable to be productive during this time it has taken a huge toll on our health and academic life coming to mental health mental health issues are the hugest concerns for adolescents of late and it has only increased due to the pandemic being confined in one place with family around you all the time can get overwhelming at times as we are unable to connect with people of our age and increased family time leads to misunderstandings and quarrel between each other as well due to the pandemic adolescents are unable to interact with their peers and the outside world frequently and are unable to cope with being lonely and isolated this leads to various mental health issues like depression anxiety bipolar disorder excessive stress and a lot more the suicide rates have only increased as adolescents can be impulsive and are unable to get the right kind of help or therapy most adolescents suffering from mental illness were unable to go to therapy due to the pandemic and lost track of how to cope with their illness i think adolescent health doctors should assess mental health and give it higher importance than it already has and government officials can begin by making most of the youth aware of mental health issues and raise awareness on the problems faced by youth mentally they should give young people ways to reach out for example give them online platforms to reach out for therapy and give out resources for them to contact like suicide helplines 
most importantly it is important for the youth to know that they can receive the help they need and that they are not alone thank you oh uh, that was excellent uh, shukti for uh, sharing with us what are the challenges uh, you and other adolescents of your age are also facing and uh, there were very like strong clear recommendations to adolescent health practitioners as well as uh, government so thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your perspectives uh, now we would move on to our uh, next uh, speaker uh, shirley Shirley is from Indonesia. She is a clinical year medical student at uh, Pelita Harapan University. Uh, her interests mainly focus on adolescent health and women's issues, especially on sexual and reproductive health and gender. Currently, she is working on a guideline which is focused on adolescent pregnancies, managing a podcast, and creating a youth-led organization of her own, which is focusing on uh, gender stereotypes. and gender equality so uh surely that's a really great and as a medical student it would be very interesting to hear from you your perspectives how you have seen the pandemic has overall impacted maybe your how you're learning your own medical education and also maybe your own health and how your peers are also experiencing this uh change and the situation which is owing to this pandemic so uh should we over to you please uh share what your perspective is thank you thank you so much dr subik first of all ladies and gentlemen i'm very pleased to be here thank you so much for the opportunities my name is charlie and i'm a clinical year medical student in indonesia i'm super happy to share my experience and of course um to share just a glimpse of my stories in the pandemic and before the pandemic so i would like to share a little bit um of my life in a slide so this is a picture of me and my friends basically before pandemic as you can see we were we were very happy before the challenges and the break of continuity of education have become a problem for me during the pandemic and of course with my friends could you please next slide please Okay so this is just a glimpse of a picture of me before also before the pandemic um the left side is basically just a peer educator workshop where i still could interact with some of my peers regarding their health issues just talking about futures and like seeing everyone from my universities and just talking to them and basically on the right side is me in, in my er rotation since i am in my clinical year of medical student so we went um to the hospital before the pandemic to gain knowledge from our patients and of course from our lecturers and it's basically me and my friends having fun just taking pictures and photos in the emergency rooms next please and of course this is now this is my reality now this is 2020 and this is actually the pictures taken just a weeks ago um still brand new and of course you notice such difference from the 2019 experience that i've had of course the fashion obviously is different because we need to wear ppe or you basically no personal protective equipment um in the hospital because i went to online class before July 2020 so from around March or April until July I went into an online class so basically we were we cannot went to the hospital because it's still red zone and we are students or medical students like me or quest sister we called are still in the um is still in the university zone you know so we are still students so we are still their responsibilities and making the responsibilities for us as a medical co assistant to go back to the hospital as is i know a very tough choice because you know there's a lot of risk a lot of risk if what if a lot of questions such as what if the medical students get contracted maybe the parents would actually sue the hospital maybe the parents would actually sue the universities there's a lot of concerns and i fully understand that and this is my reality now of course wearing ppe every day to the hospital my shifts and i got i still got to learn from my lecturers but we got our time limit in the hospital so beforehand before the pandemic i didn't got the time limit to be in the hospital to learn with my patients and of course with my doctors but now 
um, in my in my university alone in Jakarta, um, the university actually have the limited time for medical students to be at the hospital. So for me, it's around four hours per day, just four hours per day in the hospitals, five days until six days per week in the hospital to gain knowledge from the patients. And of course, this has impacted my life and my knowledge and of course my learning so much because, you know, I used to went to the hospital at night, you know, having my night shifts, having my morning shifts, and of course, you know, getting knowledge and learning with all my friends. But now we have this reality that we need to face. Um, of course, it's such a lot of things to cope with. But you know what? I always believe um, everything came for a reason. Um, and of course, this pandemic, of course, came for a reason for me to learn more. Um, next, please. Yeah, so this is just a glimpse of me um, nowadays for my meetings. Um, we gain meetings through Zoom, through online meetings, and of course, meeting new people every day in my life and has a lot of knowledge to teach me about. And how, if you ask me how coping with life has been for me, um, from the policy statement that IWH has committed and has um, written before, I've read that they actually stated using social media in constructive ways to increase awareness among adolescents about COVID-19. And that's exactly what I've been doing. This pandemic have actually taught me so much and from social media, I could learn so much from adolescents, for adolescents, and to adolescents. And with Akar Inaha or you might actually know as Indonesian Adolescents Health Associations, I'm part of it. And we're making this segment on Instagram Live called the segment of tackling COVID-19 with adolescents. And I've actually created this segment around April, 2020, because I was thinking at that time, you know what, we need, or at least I need to do something to start to at least make it all since to stay at home and didn't go out at home and just, you know, do activities at home with us. So I created the segment and we were able, um, through these days, we're able to, um, you know, gain more experts, um, gain more experts and more adolescents to join those Instagram lives every day and in order to actually make them stay at home. You know, it was one of activities that for me has created a lot of impact on my life and of course I hope for that else's life and you know I invested my time in knowing things knowing so much of things in this pandemic and that I know gonna make a really good impact on the future and a role of course at my future and I want my peers to do the same so I hope that what I've been doing with Indonesian Balsons Health Association and of course with my friends and for my friends have created such a great impact. Next please. And this is just my last slide. I would like to say, um, you know, I've met this girl around two weeks ago um, as a clinic, as a local clinic, and she didn't wear a mask. She was around like five years old. Based, um, anyways, this photo was taken by the consent of the girls itself and her aunt. Um, her aunt told me that this mother's girls um, have died from eclampsia when giving birth to her. You know, from that story, I realized something that, you know what, I still got the privilege to learn in this pandemic to actually know what is COVID-19, to actually know how to prevent COVID-19. And this girls, a lot of their, this, a lot of um, the girls around my local areas didn't got that privilege, you know. They're not so privileged to actually know COVID-19 or even to know how to wash their hands, how to wear a proper mask, you know, and I believe if we start now as adolescents, myself, it would start now to um, stop and prevent the spread of COVID-19 by educating. I believe it is the year of us to start to help and it starts from you. So I'm gonna leave you with a question. Have you started yet? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Shirley. That was really inspiring, like the work you do 
more power to you for all the work and sharing all of your perspectives that was really excellent now so uh, parallel i want to like request uh, the attendees if you have any questions please keep them coming for our lovely panelist uh, in this uh, segment so now i will move on to diana uh, diana lihavi is a monitoring and evaluation officer with 3 years of experience working alongside the executive team of Women Promotion Center based in uh, Kenya, Nairobi. She is uh, responsible for monitoring all the activities of the organization as well as training, championing, and advocating for the rights of young women and girls in informal settlements. Outside working, she also enjoys reading books, watching movies, and uh, going on adventures as well. So, uh, Diana, as a youth who is working with uh, adolescents uh, living in the largest slum area in uh, Africa. Like how have you uh, perceived the pandemic's effect on their health? And also, if you could uh, share with us like a few of the coping strategies that were employed and interventions which are being done to address these uh, challenges. So, uh, Diana, looking forward to your uh, response. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabuk. Um, so look, I've already done an introduction, so I'll just go straight to my presentation. So I'm working with Women Promotion Center, and basically we're working in a slum, in that the slum is called Kibera. Kibera is the largest slum in East Africa. So basically we've been meeting young girls and young women between the age of 10 to 18, and then young women between the age of 18 to 32. And uh, after this, the pandemic struck, we've been experiencing, like girls have been experiencing difficulties and challenges regarding the coronavirus. So one of the challenges that all the girls we've interacted with have given us is uh, we've been having unplanned pregnancies. There is an increase in unplanned pregnancies. That is uh, whereby, you know, when schools are closed, you realize that all the girls and the adolescents are at home and the adolescents are very, they, are, they want to experiment, they want to explore, so they end up having this unprotected sex and end up getting unplanned pregnancies. And after having the unplanned pregnancies, sorry, you realize that these girls want to conduct abortion because they fear the stigma, stigmatization in the society. So these girls end up conducting unsafe abortion because they don't want to go to those health service providers who will, they think might stigmatize them or might expose them to the society. So when they conduct this and self abortion, you realize that these girls end up, some end up dying, some end up losing their uterus and uh, any other complications related to unsafe abortion. Another challenge that we have heard from the girls, some claim that they have been having, a, we have this, the gender inequality stuff, whereby you realize that their parents are telling them that they should go and get married so that uh, they should go and get married so that they can leave the chances for their brothers. Or you realize that these girls, because the economy is too tough, the parents and, the, and those who are taking care of the girls want them to get married so that they can at least reduce the number of people in the family that they're supposed to cater for. So you realize that these girls end up having many difficulties, a lot of difficulties when it comes to this gender inequality. Another thing, we have also had a problem where girls are unable to access sanitary towels. For example, you realize that Kenyan schools, when schools are on, girls are given sanitary towels at the end of every month. But unfortunately, now the schools are closed, so these girls can no longer access those sanitary towels that they were, used to, they were given before the schools were closed. So these girls have difficulties accessing those. And then we also have, okay, we are dealing with 10 to 18 years old. So some of the girls are able to use contraceptives. But since we have this coronavirus, some of them are unable to even access the sanitary, sorry, some of them are unable to access those contraceptives, their family planning methods. So they end up getting these unplanned pregnancies. Okay, our strategies and interventions as an organization, we've been running a community awareness for the girls. We are creating an awareness on COVID-19 and its challenges, so we try to teach girls on how to cope up with what is happening, and in case they are experiencing any difficulties in their family, so they come to us and we help them to get away forward. 
Uh, another thing, we've been also providing sanitary towels for these young girls. We are liaising with the, an organization that does these reusable sanitary towels. So we take sanitary towels and distribute to these vulnerable girls who are unable to get sanitary towels. And on the other hand, we are also engaging these girls so that they don't have that time to go out and experiment those or whatever I had explained about the sexual, the, the girls being active sexually. So we get them engaged in activities like after we get those sanitary towels, we use these girls to go and uh, distribute sanitary towels to other girls. We also engage them in community activities, for example, such as cleaning, such as uh, distributing the PPEs. And uh, we also engage the girls in talent shows, like if a girl has a talent, she can showcase it at our, at our organization. Another thing for the girls who want to conduct safe, ab and safe, ab okay, safe abortion, we link these girls with the, service, the willing service providers who are able to conduct this safe abortion to the girls so that they can be able to go back to school. Because in Africa, most probably here in Kibera, once a girl gets pregnant, that means that this girl will no longer go back to school, maybe because she'll fear stigmatization. And if the girl is willing to conduct safe abortion, we connect these girls with the willing safe abortion providers. We are also engaging the girls in uh, online education. There is an organization called Girls with Mission that is doing online education for the girls who can no longer, who cannot access uh, things like computers, laptops, and internet. So the organization, we link those girls who are willing to read it or to learn, to continue with their learning. We link them with the organization so they are able to continue with their, with their education until the schools are open. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward for any questions I can respond to. So, um Thank you so much, Anna, for uh, like raising all of these important issues, like what the challenges are facing. Abortion is in itself a stigmatized topic, even in a non-pandemic uh, situation, and it's understandable what levels of uh, hurdles uh, young people in these uh, spaces are facing. And uh, like respect for the great work you and your organization is uh, doing on this. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Diana, for sharing all of your uh, perspectives. So uh, now, uh, for the last panelist on this uh, segment, we have uh, Sophie. Uh, Dr. Sophie Ramo Gonzalez is a pediatrician who is specialized in adolescent medicine, providing health services to underserved and fragile youth in Houston, USA. Currently, she is earning her master's in global health policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Sophie is a member of the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine and the is a co-founder of the Global Adolescent Health Significant Interest Group. In addition, she completed an internship and participated uh, in the development of the Global Accelerated Action for the Health of Adolescents, also known as the AHA Guidance uh, at WHO in Geneva. So uh, Sophie, uh, before I move to the question, uh, I would also like to thank all the panelists from both panel one and uh, all of the speakers in this uh, panel, because uh, after Sophie gives her intervention, she would be also giving the concluding remarks and also the vote of thanks. So uh, thank you so much. It was a uh, great uh, moderating this panel and hearing all of these uh, perspectives. And I would leave uh, Sophie with the question and hand it over to her that Sophie we could uh, share some of your clinical experience on the impact of COVID on adolescent health, mostly in the community setting. So over to you, Sophie, and uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Shavik. Hi, everyone. So I'm Sophie. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit of my experience as an adolescent health physician in a community clinic in Houston, Texas. So uh, my first slide is to give a little bit of background on what's going on in the US right now. And as we know, we are a hotspot, which you know, it's very unfortunate. And um, if you can see, uh, just to give briefly some data, we have about 8 million confirmed cases and about 218,641. Um, death, which is a horrific um, number. So uh, we are located here, the clinic in Texas. So I put a little map on the right side where you can see the little yellow uh, triangle. 
and that's Texas. And if you can see in the last seven days for CDC reports, our cases have really gone up. So we are really on the worst right now um, part. Um, if you can see, since the epidemic starts, so the data is since, I would say, March, there's about 838,000 cases confirmed in Texas, which is a huge number as well. And right now we're averaging about like 5,000 cases a day. And um, to give you an idea where Houston is um, located on uh, the Texas map, I'll put another little uh, chart with a arrow so you can see where Houston is. To give it just a little bit of background as well about my clinic work, so a community clinic, we serve about 190,000 community members annually. We are specialized in underserved, uninsured. Um, so moving on, next slide, please. So about the impact, and I think, you know, that goes back to what all the speakers have mentioned, you know, regarding the experience with healthcare, what they've experienced. So the first thing really has been the disruption of medical services. And I think, um, as Shukti mentioned, mental health has been a big impact. Uh, we've seen a rise in anxiety, PTSD, I would say a lot of eating disorders, um, you know, flaring up during, uh, you know, this COVID pandemic. Also, um, sexual reproductive health has been, you know, highly impacted in the sense that the access, for example, to long acting reversible contraception type of procedure, IUDs or implant placements have been delayed or patient being able to refill their, you know, birth control pill. So there have been really uh, a difficulty with uh, all the services we provide as adolescent medicine physicians. Also, um, we also had preventive care and wellness visits um, decrease. So we know part of uh, our care is every year we get, you know, checkups for adolescents. And we've seen that, of course, they've been canceling their visit because of COVID, because of fear of having infection. Um, so we've seen decreased rates of HP vaccination, decreased rate of vaccines in general, and also, you know, a fairly pretty steady increase of obesity rates, right? Um, adolescents are home, they're not physically active, um, they are, uh, you know, eating more, more stress, more anxiety, so that's affected that as well. Um, on top of it, I would say, um, kids with special needs, you know, that usually come also for their maintenance checkup, uh, we're not able to access the clinic since they're a more vulnerable population and we're staying home. Um, on the next um, important point is also stigmatization of infected children uh, and family. Sorry, Molly. Back. Um, so what's happening? So in the clinic, we really try to reorganize and have, you know, triaging, right? So sick patients and well patient, right? And uh, we would always refer the very sick patients to the tertiary, the main hospital that we have. Um, so we would see mostly, I would say, infected patients with mild disease or asymptomatic, and we could see a big stigma on them. You know, um, sometimes the adolescent and the family wouldn't really say that they had the infection unless, you know, you're prompt to ask them. So a lot of stigma in the community, right? Um, and even more isolated, you know, by their community. Um, the other also important point is an increase in health inequalities for the minor migrants. So because my clinic uh, focuses on undocumented and migrants, and as you may know, the situation of Texas and the borders is that we have a lot of influx of undocumented minor migrants from, you know, Central America mostly. And therefore, this clinic that we have is their first point of entry many times. And the reason they come is because when they want to roll to school, they need to have vaccinations. So we've lost kind of this population during the COVID-19. Um, increasing domestic violence and child abuse. I think, you know, we've all seen the reports, the numbers, um, you know, it's, it's devastating. Of course, as well, financial burden on the families. So we've seen now adolescent, and I think, uh, Miki, you mentioned that earlier on, now having to look for jobs to help their families or, you know, and so dropping out of school and leaving school, you know, on the side just to help out the families, right? And with the financial burden goes as well, you know, access to nu adequate nutrition, you know, uh, food security, etc. And of course, the last important disruption of schooling, as we've mentioned before, so poor access to IT, uh, difficulty even having, you know, one computer for five children, sometimes I've seen in the family. So very difficult um, for the online learning. Next slide, please. 
So I just wanted to show a little bit of the map on uh, the reopening of the schools in the USA. So the current map shows you, um, this is about, this is data on 50,000 schools in the US and you have in-person versus virtual learning. As it's now, I would say virtual learning is um, a little bit more common than in-person. However, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which you know advocates for adolescents, strongly recommends the in-person you know school as as long as it's safe enough right because we know that as we've mentioned with the speakers before the impact the negative outcomes of you know online school have been very very uh, very bad so um we hope that for the us by november about 60 percent will be able to be physically in school or some hybrid kind of version meaning half in school um you know some days in school some days uh, virtual learning Next one, please. Okay, okay. So what are the lessons learned? And I think that's important because we've talked a lot about the challenges, you know, I would say all the negative impact of this COVID-19, you know, on our lessons, but what about things that we've learned that we've been surprised about? So first of all, I must talk about telemedicine and telehealth services. So in the US, because of very complex insurance systems, reimbursement, telemedicine was not even in the picture, I would say, um, you know, perhaps within two or five years. In my clinic, in two weeks, we had to transition to telehealth services, meaning that you can get all your visits online um, with your doctor. So everyone had to be trained from, you know, front desk staff to all the providers and doctors and all the staff. And also we've been very flexible uh, with approaches to healthcare, meaning by that, that we started creating, you know, if a patient is sick and doesn't want to enter the clinic, how can we give him like tests, you know, lab tests. So perhaps we go to their car and we do tests for COVID or for other respiratory disease. Uh, perhaps they only come, you know, a certain time during the day to get their blood tests done, et cetera. So we really try to be as much flexible with it. And of course, um, going back to telehealth, we've really installed mental health telehealth. And that was a big thing because we have a big, um, fortunately, a big psychiatric and behavior health um, type of, uh, of, uh, of services. So we've tried to, to maintain and access, you know, 40 adolescents on their phones. Okay. And I think another point important is really teamwork and collaboration. I've been really impressed about community work, you know, people helping each other. I think uh, we've seen that human beings are capable of a lot of good solidarity, you know, help and resilience as well. And I would just, you know, finish my quick presentation on, you know, my slide that says education, education, please educate everyone around you. Every opportunity that you have to talk to a peer, a family member, um, a patient, anyone is education, right? And this is a little um, infographic from the CDC, but I'm sure WHO and each country has their own and please share their M around. And I put this little infographic on the right with this, uh, you know, it's for Halloween time. The CDC just came with that just to make sure that parents and family have been careful during Halloween time, you know, advocating against the trick and trick which happens in the US. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, I'm gonna conclude uh, my part. Next, please, next slide. Okay, so uh, now, um, again, uh, you know, it's been really fascinating to hear about uh, so many important things, and I really appreciate all the diverse uh, live reality of, you know, our second, uh, our panelists, you know, uh, the youth panelists that we have across the globe. So now I'm going to open the floor for um, a few questions, um, and, um, and after that, you know, we'll go into uh, the conclusion of the webinar. So um, we have a question, and actually it's going to be a question for um, briefly to answer for each of our uh, speakers. So uh, the question is going to be, uh, what advice would you give um, to adolescents around the world on how they can cope during COVID-19 pandemic? And I think we're going to start to you, Shukti. So as an adolescent, I personally feel that you can spend more time with your family, or you can focus on your hobbies and focus on yourself rather than spending most of your time on social media, stay away from it because it's getting very toxic these days and it's a huge distraction from your academic life as well. So I think social media detoxing and uh, focusing on your mental health, like you can practice exercise, you can 
do home remedies like yoga like meditation or you can focus on yourself so basically just like reach out if you have any sort of mental illness you can uh, go to therapy online there are various platforms online where, where they'll counsel you so don't get confined in your own space reach out and focus on the space that you're in right now don't isolate yourself is what i would suggest Thank you so much, Shirley, uh, sorry, uh, Shukti, for uh, this very important information. Um, now on to uh, Shirley, our medical student, who would love to see what advice you have for adolescents around the world. All right, thank you so much for the question, right? It's actually also the question I ask myself a lot, but I agree with Shakti, of course, focusing on the hobbies, developing our hobbies and developing the knowledge that we have. And of course, um, also for me, personal advice is that I would actually encourage adolescents also to help their peers, to help their peers with many other reasons, you know, first starting from um, social media, because of course, this is the world of social media, everyone is on social media. But again, um, adolescents in social media tend to actually not only looking for knowledge, but they are also looking for something fun to, um, you know, develop their hobby in, develop their hobby with. So, you know, engaging with more peers, um, talking to them, and then sharing stories, experiences could definitely help ourselves in the self-isolation itself. And, and of course, in helping our peers as well. So I guess, um, the advice that I could give is that just start anything by developing your hobby and your knowledge and anything you like would probably help you so much in this pandemic. Thank you uh, so much, Shirley. Um, next, we're going to ask uh, Diana, our youth worker uh, from Kenya, about what advice would she give to her peers and lessons um, around the world. Okay, thank you. My advice to peers and uh, the young, uh, they should keep themselves engaged. They should get an, a hobby that excites them. And they should also remember that there is a future. After this pandemic, there is a future. So they need to focus on the future and not think that life ends today. They should also remember, they should also share their opinions and their experiences with adults, those who are mature, those who are who can help them because once you have a challenge once you have a difficulty or something if you share it it's always it's, it's always have solved thank you thank you uh, so much diana for these remarks so i know there is a few more questions in the box and we'll you know for a question of time we won't be able to answer them right now but we'll try to reach out to directly to you and answer that so um you know we're now getting to the concluding remarks i think um we just wanted to um, show, sorry, the result of the polls of the first questions, right? So on uh, what, uh, you know, factors would enable more intersectoral working among young professionals. And you can see here, the, you know, just for you to take a look at the work cloud answers. Okay. Moving on, so um, again, it's been a really great uh, pleasure uh, to moderate and thank you again, Shavik, for all your good work and all the team and the great speakers. Um, it was very appreciative to have, you know, such a committed audience as well in attending this webinar. Um, I think, you know, with this time being, there is so much uncertainty that really we have to do our best to stay informed, connected, educate, and really advocate and share best practice um, to advance, you know, adolescent health because we need to advocate for them. Um, also, I would like to mention um, that uh, the IWIH, um, along with other organizations, has put together a policy brief on protecting adolescent health in response to COVID-19. And you can find that on the idolh.org website, and we can share the links in the chat as well. Um, also, I wanna make sure that you complete the evaluations form, um, and we're also adding that to the chat. Um, again, thank you so, so much for joining us today. This has been a beautiful experience for all of us. And from the YPN, um, this is, you know, our second webinar um, and, you know, it's been hard work, but we've been fascinated with this uh, group of panelists and I want to thank everyone for their hard work. 
And again, if you want to join the young professionals, please uh, visit your, our website at iwhypn.org. And I think that's it. And I hope everyone has a good afternoon, day, night, wherever you are in the world. Keep strong. Thank you.